Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to everyone, including Jim Hart, Logan Larson, Mike Akins, and everyone, welcome our new patron, Michael. Yay, Michael. Yay. On this episode of DTNS, do you want ads on your TV screensaver? Everyone says no, but maybe we got it anyway. Does OpenAI have a retention problem? And is AI note-taking the future? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 26th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We've got a good show for everyone, and as we always do, we're going to start with some quick hits. Disney Plus announced it will charge $6.99 per month for adding an extra member to ad-supported plans, or $9.99 for ad-free plans, letting subscribers share access with somebody outside their household. This option applies only to standalone Disney Plus subscriptions and excludes bundled plans. After 27 years, WinAmp, I used to love that app, has gone open source <laughs> and has released its complete source code on GitHub, inviting developers to collaborate on the project. The iconic media player was released by Nullsoft in 1997, gaining massive popularity with the rise of MP3s. WinAmp was purchased by AOL in 2013 and discontinued in 2014 before being acquired by Radionami, who just wasn't able to bring WinAmp back to its former glory. The WinAmp team announced in May that the MP3 player would be open sourced on September 24th and the WinApp GitHub repository already has 2,500 plus stars and 600 plus forks. It used to really whip the llamas. You know. Yeah, everybody knows. Mm -hmm. WinApp, yeah, love you. X released its full first transparency report. This is the first one since Elon Musk bought the social media platform, formerly known as Twitter. The report includes content takedowns and account suspensions from the first half of 2024. So the notes suspensions have more than tripled since the last time that the company shared data. So X suspended just under 5.3 million accounts during this last period, compared with 1.6 million suspensions during the first six months of 2022. Suspensions are up. California Governor Gavin Newsom signed Assembly Bill 286, known as the Click to Cancel Bill, into law, designed to simplify the process for consumers to cancel subscriptions. It was first introduced back in April and requires companies that offer online in-app signups to also provide the option for unsubscribing through those same channels. The FTC proposed a similar nationwide rule last year. Hopefully, they will get around to approving it. Samsung un unveiled the 4.6 inch, 14.6 inch rather, Galaxy Tab S10 Ultra and 12.4 inch Galaxy Tab S10 Plus, both built with AI enhancements, starting at uh, one, $1,200 and then $99. $999, uh, respectively. Samsung's Galaxy S24 FE comes with some new updates as well and a price hike. The phone will feature a larger 6.7-inch display that's up from last year's 6.4-inch, powered by the Exynos 2400SE uh, uh, chipset in both Europe and the U.S., also a shift from the Snapdragon processor that was used in the Galaxy S23 FE. Pricing is expected to be somewhere between $700 and $750. The S24 FE also comes with 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage. LG Smart TVs, uh, of which I have one uh, just outside this uh, <laughs> this room in my living room, uh, including its most expensive OLED models, have started showing screensaver ads across the home screen before the regular screensaver activates. So something between the, uh, the TV sort of going dead and then kicking in the screensaver, this would be somewhere in between this. These new ads are turned on by default, but they can apparently be deactivated in the settings. I looked, did not figure out how to do this, but that's what LG says you can do. LG also said it found that screensaver ads drove on average 2.5 times higher lift in brand awareness 
challenging the assumption that a viewer's attention is limited once the television screen is idle. Blah, blah, blah. LG is not the first company to try this out. Smart TV manufacturers have been trying this out for some time. Um, in TV ecosystems, Samsung, Roku, TCL, and others have also tried this. Now, I have had my current LG TV for less than six months. Um, it's a it's a very nice TV. It's not LG's top of the line, but it's not the most entry level either. Cannot figure out how to replicate these ads. Might be rolling out some somewhat slowly, but I did end up uh, finding some stuff in my settings uh, because I was looking around for it this morning that I thought was kind of interesting. For example. I, uh, I have AI options in my television. Uh, and when, you know, I originally, you know, we, we, you kind of get like, you know, bright or cinema or, um, you know, daytime type things. I have this new picture wizard that hmm. allows me to it, go through a bunch of for anybody looking at the video, by the way, when you see those curtains, that's just a reflection of the actual curtains in my house. <laughs> um, but but otherwise, you go through a variety of it's it's kind of like a captcha type thing. Like what what scenes do you like best? And then it uh, eventually spit back out to me. Well, Sarah, you like a balanced picture, which is true. I think that's almost always true. This is a TV I've had in my house, though, for, you know, let's call it six months, maybe a little bit under that. I never knew about this stuff, which kind of leads me to the question of uh, when we start getting ads in our TVs, I mean, do we, I mean, are we even surprised at this point anymore? Well, I, I don't believe that this is anything revolutionary. What we have seen uh, uh, repeatedly is that TVs are becoming cheaper and more commoditized. Uh, there's, it's never been easier to get something that is a very, very high quality from uh, uh, any kind of manufacturer or online for under $300, sometimes under $200 for televisions that used to be extraordinarily high priced. And so when everything is getting commoditized and margins are getting really, really, really thin, then you have to think of new ways that you can squeeze money out of the customers. And in a collapsing ad market, advertisers are more likely to try non-traditional venues. And so if you have a $150 television, you're going to get an ad for Lays on it every once in a while. Yeah. It, it makes perfect sense. I mean, the TVs are ridiculously inexpensive as Justin, you know, has, has laid out and they're these big giant screens. If you put an ad on it, th their metrics are telling you people notice them. So yeah. if it's working, this is just going to be the new thing. I, I, I am not surprised by it at all. In fact, I won't be surprised if you actually see on the lower end TVs that you cannot find the settings to turn it off because I don't think you'll be able to. If you want to turn off the ads, you actually have to buy a more expensive TV. Now, that's not the case now. They're saying that you can set, you know, you can go into your settings and turn it off. But I won't be surprised when there are televisions where you simply just can't. They're just, you know, you're going you know, to get ads with the TV. I, I, I would actually be surprised there, Rob, because I do think that there is a lot of competition in this space. And so unless it is a industry wide decision to say that we're going to sell you or the price is so cheap. If it's like, here's a $50 television, it's a 40 inch 4K television, but you can't turn off ads. If there's right. a market for that, then yeah. But otherwise... You know, there's so many players. The the if if one of them commits to saying we allow you to turn off ads, I think they're just going to win. I mean, we've talked about telly in the past, which is a somewhat you know a uh, novel way to always have a an ad bar under your television. And the company has gone so far as to say like, oh, and if you cover it up, we're going to know. And then <laughs> there's going to be an issue and we're going to turn off your access to YouTube TV or whatever, um, whatever you're getting. But, but yeah, I think I think uh, the 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 conversation of like, well, if you buy the most expensive LG TV, you shouldn't even have to deal with this is is kind of silly. Right. LG is going to try to use this with any model of television. If you pay a very, uh, you know, a subsidized price for whatever reason for something, you know, a piece of hardware, 
that you're going to be looking at all the time. Companies are going to say like, well, you know, you only paid $150 for this television. If you're more in the $200 to $2,500 range, then, um, then I think the, 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 the conversation about I don't need this, I bought this thing, and that should be the end of it. This is not a subscription television that I bought. Um, that you, you have a little bit more leeway there. Well, by the way, this happens already. When you turn on a smart television and there's a menu there and it has preferential treatment to a streaming service, that doesn't just happen because there's a straw poll at the factory and yeah. they decide that Disney Plus is going to be the thing that's up there. It's because Disney got them a check. If you get a television and on the remote control, there's a button for a branded service, that is something that is negotiated and paid for mm -hmm. by Netflix or Amazon Prime or anything like that. So the idea that these are not already uh, 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 colonized for advertising is is a fiction. This already happens. The difference is doing something that is up there in front of your face. And, you know, uh, I think that we're going to see a lot more of these things. The, the question is whether or not the price comes down enough that we are okay with uh, that exchange. Well, and if there ever becomes a situation where you don't have the option to turn them off in settings. Again, I couldn't yeah. find my option, but I also haven't seen an ad yet. So, you know, I don't know if my, you know, if my firmware updates over the weekend and things change, I'll let y'all know. But, yeah. but that, that's a big part of it too. So folks, we're going to change gears a little bit. And Justin, I'm glad you're back because I want to get your take mm -hmm. on, on this Google L this Google notebook LM stuff, which you want to talk about. They, they actually released a few new features today. Um, you, um, YouTube videos are an audio files are able to create shareable AI generated audio discussions from rich media and it's prompted with LLM. So if you essentially are, if you load up a MP3 file or you can load up a YouTube video, this can summarize it um, pretty straightforward. But what it can also do is it can actually take that summary and then give you an audio summary of the summary. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you can actually have it listen to an MP3, watch a YouTube video, and then actually talk to you and tell you what it thinks about it, which I thought was kind of cool. So I played around with this earlier today. I actually loaded up my script from uh, this morning's Daily Tech Headlines. And as I would expect, it was, it was pretty straightforward. It, it summarized it very, very well. It gave me back exactly what I thought I would get back from an LLM summarizing something that I had that I had written. Then I said, okay, well, let's try the new feature. Let's actually pull it, you know, in, you know, let's pull in the MP3. That also summarized it very, very well. It's, it was probably 85, 90% congruent with the actual text version. What things got really interesting was when I actually <laughs> told it to do the audio uh, overview of the audio file. So it took a five minute podcast and turned it into 15 minutes and 30 seconds of content. And it had sentiment in there that I never wrote or never spoke when I created. I mean, an extra 10 minutes also an extra 10 minutes. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was very interesting. Like I said, there were things that I never said. There were things that I never talked about that it actually just pulled in from, I guess the internet or I'm, I'm wondering, is it looking at other stuff that I've written inside of like my, cause I, I use Google for everything. So is it going and looking in my other Google documents and saying, oh, here's how Rob thinks about this, or here's how Rob thinks about that. And then assuming the sentiment that I might have towards a story that had none earlier. So Justin, I, I see potential issues here. Uh, you know, the, the yeah, summaries, yeah, if, you're, <laughs> if you're relying on these summaries, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get, even though they're giving it to you off of your own stuff. Um, you know, what do you think about all this? So, uh, uh, in order, number one, I think that AI is tr is very, very good at summarizing. It's something that I think that we're probably going to see more than we are right now. It is probably an underutilized feature. I think that in transcription uh, is something that we are just going to see more and more. It's going to revolutionize some uh, industries. I would say, including podcasting. I think that there is a world in which good apps, top of class apps for podcasting in the very near future are just going to allow you to swipe through text summaries of what each episode is about, especially things like this, episode, shows like this that are very topic dependent and you're gonna be able to sample into that. That being said, if you are then pushing it back out to an audio format and it is adding 10 minutes of content 
I would have some very big questions about where that extra 10 minutes came from. My guess is that it is not searching your other stuff. I think that it is probably just through the training data, but it also, I think, shows a poorly trained model that this should not be 10 minutes different than the original stuff, especially if the point of it is summary, right? Like you don't want well, expansion. Yeah. You want, yeah. you, if anything, you want it shorter than it, than, than it was before. I mean, Rob, of, of the 10 minutes where you were like, huh, I never said that. I didn't tell it to say that. Did it feel like you? Um, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Now, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when the audio summaries first came out. And we were like, wow, because I think when we played it on the show, it fooled me. I thought it was actual people who were you know, having a yeah. podcast for probably the first minute. I was able to pick up almost instantaneously that, okay, this is not what I said. This is not how I wrote it. There's definitely no sentiment in what I said uh, that this is pulling through. So I was able to know that, that notice that pretty quickly, but I would, I would imagine though, that if I'm doing this on my, on some content that came from years ago, I might've forgotten what I thought or, or forgotten what I said. So this could literally have me, you know, pulling up information on myself, stuff that I actually created and give me a different sentiment than I had when I, when I initially created it based off of what the algorithm thinks it should be. And that was kind of concerning to me. Yeah. I, I if you are wondering whether or not it is tr that the model notebook LM is trained on your other writing and you did not have an opportunity to tell it what to train on, that's very concerning. Very, very concerning, especially considering that what Google wants out of this is for a lot of this kind of data to be more forward facing. They they don't want it necessarily just for internal purposes. They want you to feel comfortable sending this kind of stuff in emails. If all of a sudden mm -hmm. every email that you've ever written is, uh, you know, uh, uh, now fair game for it to be trained. Well, I mean. That's that's not good. That's not bueno. That's not I mean, good. I, I've got friends at this point who say, you know, I will I'll be in my car, so I'll dictate an email, have chat GPT, you know, or something similar, um, yeah. you know, make that email more concise, send it to my team. And I'm like. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> like, so, oh my gosh. That is like that is like just taking so much control <laughs> out of your own hands for me. If I if I summarize a uh, something that I wrote, which I, we, I you know, I, I play around with this as much as I can. Every time, every single time, the summary, I'm like, eh, yeah, but they missed a couple things. Then that doesn't sound like me. One of the one of the stories that I talked about this morning, I was talking about open AI and some things that are going on with open AI. We're actually going to get into some of it. But I never mentioned chat GPT. Not once. It never yeah. came up. The summary is actually talking about OpenAI and ChatGPT. Now, it did it. It was correct. The, the way that it talked about ChatGPT was correct, but that never came from me. It never came from what I fed it. So where is the 10 minutes coming from? It has to be, as you said, going off of training data or going right out to the yeah. Internet and pulling pulling content. Well, I guess that would take that's and, the definition and of recent training news. data and recent news and actually yeah. giving you sentiment. And the thing is, it's like, you know, I talked about Elon Musk. I never said whether I liked what Elon Musk was doing or didn't like what Elon Musk was doing. This made an assumption that I felt some kind of way about it. And yeah. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting because I go out of my way, particularly with Daily Tech Headlines. I'm just telling you what the news is. I'm not telling flat. you how to feel about it. It's flat. Yeah. So the fact that it actually decided that, well, here's how we think that you are interpreting this. And this is what we're going to put in your summary. That was that was really telling to me. So. Folks, you better be careful with this stuff if you're using it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it does not feel ready for prime time in my Well, opinion. and and if you if you have had any situations like what Rob is describing or anything else where you're like, huh, how are these how are these LLMs actually working? Uh, do send uh, your feedback our way. We'd love to hear about it. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. 
So we mentioned this very briefly at the beginning of DTNS on Wednesday because it was breaking news right as our show was starting. Thank you so much, breaking news. But OpenAI CTO Mira Marotti, um, now along with two other senior leaders, OpenAI Chief Research Officer Bob McGrew and a Research VP Barrett Zoff, have all left the company. Marotti said that her departure was to further pursue personal exploration. That happens with executives sometimes. CEO Sam Altman of OpenAI responded that such leadership changes are typical for fast-growing companies. OpenAI is also planning a restructuring to become a for-profit benefit corporation, which would give Altman equity for the first time, though the details are apparently still being finalized. Sounds like there are a lot of balls in the air, Justin. What is your take? Well, a fast-rising female executive at a definitional company by the initials of MM quits and then winds up going to a rival as the CEO. That's not Mira Marotti. It was Marissa Mayer going from Google to Yahoo back in uh, the, the Gosh, uh, I think really 2012. Yeah. 2012 was when yeah. that happened. Minute, yeah. Now, do I believe that Mira Marotti is going to go to a competitor to OpenAI? Yes, I do. Do I believe she is going to go to Google? Yes, I do. I'm going to call it right now. This feels very, very, very uh, 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 poaching somebody that knows how OpenAI is organized. Let's remember that Mira Marathi was named as the CEO initially during the kerfuffle a year ago. She is somebody that was uh, uh, oh, very. Oh, that's forward. right. I think a lot of people might have. Uh, might <laughs> it was short lived, but yes, yes, yes. She, she was then replaced the by Emma Cheer, and then Emma Cheer was then replaced by Sam Altman again. Uh, that was a really crazy long weekend, but. Uh, there is, uh, uh, I don't know the, 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 if we're going to read the Kremlinology, you read very heavily into Sam Altman saying, when Mira told me today that she was leaving, that means that this was not something that was discussed and orderly planned for. Mm -hmm. Why does somebody leave with that short a notice? Well, it might be because the place where she's going to land isn't necessarily what open AI would like. And, that's going to be the case. Now, uh, I think that she'd be a good hire for Google. It would show that Google is, is uh, uh, not in the position that they need to be in terms of AI, which I do think is an existential threat to them. If she doesn't go to Google, I would imagine Anthropic and, and it's backing from Amazon would be a possible destination or Microsoft. Microsoft, not quite as uh, uh, close to open AI in the same way after the $6.5 billion round that just came in or, and this is also a very uh, uh, likely option. Anybody that comes out of open AI right now, they can pretty much walk into any VC and start up something themselves. So yeah. I, I don't think Mira Marathi is going to be long for being in the AI space, but I'm planning my flag. She's going to pull the reverse Marissa Mayer and go, go to, to Google. Google. Yeah. Going to go to Google. And Justin, you've talked about how leadership at Google is has been shaky and, you know, for some time now. So something yes. like this. Would you would you consider her to be going into a CTO role again or something I, else? I don't know what the actual name would be. Who knows whether or not they would try to maybe... Uh, uh, spin out another AI thing with Google where she'd have a smaller team. The one thing that she would know, which I do think is very, very valuable, is how open AI is organized. You know, that's that's something that a lot of people don't realize with this space is that AI was an extraordinarily academic uh, uh, pursuit for a very long time. And a lot of people that have invested a lot of money into this, including Google, have a lot of academics that are leading things and not a lot of product people. The problem is, is that we're no longer in the age of white papers. We are in the age of products and products that better work and they better be amazing almost immediately out of the box because that's just where we are in the life cycle of this technology. What she will bring to wherever she goes, but I think it would be valuable at Google, is literally just an eye for organization because that's been a consistent problem with Google is that they don't know who's really running the show. And, and it's led to lackluster product from them. Yeah, I, I think another part of it could also be that there's probably a Brinks truck backing up to her house. 
and someone from Google is saying, where would you like us to drop all this money? Yeah. Oh, she ain't going to go for cheap. <laughs> She's not jumping from open AI yeah. that just, again, closed the biggest funding round in history. In what history. Used, that would used to, what 10 years ago used to be the entire allotment of venture capital for New York, Texas, and California. Like th that used to be all of it. Now OpenAI gets it for their Series B funding. They're, they're round B. And the other part of this is that Sam Altman is about to get broke off. He he ultimately is going to now get uh, you know you know get some money out of this. You would have to think that other people that high up in the company were going to get equity as well. Mm -hmm. So if she's leaving now, because I, you know these things are happening at the same time. You know if they if they're saying it's not a coincidence, that's what they're saying. I might choose to believe otherwise. But you have the CTO leaving right at the time when the company is restructuring and no longer going to be managed by a nonprofit, but be a, a for-profit benefit. So that's that's very interesting. And like I said, I, I would imagine that there is a Brink truck, maybe two, <laughs> backing up to her house saying, how much money would you like to come here? Well, but I also, thing, I also, is, I also is, love is, the idea of like, I'm going to pursue personal exploration. Yeah, exactly. And, like, like she's going to get into and, kayaking. And I have explored that I should go to Apple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not trying to laugh, but you know, come on, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, billionaires at this point. So, uh, so, so yeah, I think, I think, I think the whole, I'd like to take some time off to reflect on my life. Sometimes that is very, very true. Sometimes people retire uh, and then that uh, you can do that, you know, if you can afford it, go, f go forth, go forth. Uh, yeah. But, um, but, but, but this does feel, this feels a little more insidious. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, the other question with the, uh, uh, the fact that now we're talking equity is that they might have divided the pie equity wise and she might not have loved the size of her slice. Yeah, that's and right. maybe she was, she was a little miffed that it wasn't quite what she thought it was going to be. And now she wants to, to explore where she's going to go, uh, uh, you know, elsewise. So I don't know. I, I, I very much believe that she is, uh, she's in a good position. She's young. She's, uh, she's going to be able to, to pretty much write her ticket wherever her personal explanation goes, you know, maybe she's going to get into smoothies. Maybe it's going to be green juice. Maybe <laughs> she's going to be into model trains, who knows? Or maybe it's going to be going to work for Google. Like I think. Wouldn't be nice to just be like i'm gonna go into model trains like full yeah. time just, just, i'm starting to tick tock about yeah. model i'm gonna be that's on model just, train that's talk. just kind of what awesome. i'm doing so yeah i'm just <laughs> really i'm just moving in a trains. different direction right now <laughs> yeah you know ai powered all right well uh <laughs> i know a lot of you probably have uh, ideas about this and again feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send uh your feedback questions comments all the things we also, speaking of the mailbag, got a nice one from Darren from Cambridge in the UK, wanting to add a little bit of background to the Be My Eyes uh, part of Meta's partnership um, with, uh, with, with Be My Eyes uh, that we talked about on Wednesday's show. Uh, Darren says, in general, there's excitement about around wearables with AI and camera in the blind community for obvious reasons. The functionality is still at the early stage, but asking your AI if the path or the sidewalk ahead is free of obstacles or determining the correct house number when visiting somewhere new is possible now. You can do this with a phone, but using wearables leaves both hands free. You've got a cane. You might have a guide dog uh, in use. And the open ear speakers allows outside sound for safety. Darren says, Be My Eyes is already an app that provides sighted volunteers to help blind people with tasks via the phone camera. And the partnership with Meta allows this to be done using the camera on the glasses. The key part is that the connection to a volunteer is frictionless by means of a single voice command while wearing glasses to establish one-way video and two-way audio. Darren says, this is a bit of a game changer for the blind at this point as the meta Ray-Bans are relatively low cost compared with specialist alternatives. Perhaps it's an opportunity to give Meta some praise for this partnership as I am guilty as many for criticizing them continually. That's kind of cool. Hooray. Hooray to Meta. Yeah. Huzzah. I mean, yeah. Listen, you know, anything that is, 
designed to to help uh, differently abled folks. I, you know, if it's Meta or anybody else, yeah. you know, it's it's you, you got to say that, that's great. If be, this be is going to help somebody, that's is great. A great uh, it, it's a great service. They worked with OpenAI early, uh, early on too. They were one of the, the big beneficial use cases for AI. So uh, good on them for continuing to get it in uh, the hands of people that need it. Well, thanks to Darren and thanks to you, Justin Robert Young. Why don't you tell us what you've got going on these days? Well, friends, we are entering into October and if any... Uh, uh, any history is our guide, then it's going to be full of surprises and you can follow all of them at politics, politics, politics. Got a lot going on over there. Might have some surprises of our own coming up. Check it out. Politics, politics, politics. Patron, stick around for our extended show. Good day, Internet. We're going to talk about dating. Oh, what fun. Or at least what happens when a dating app gets reimagined. <laughs> you can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Jason Howe and Lynn Peralta. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>